Welcome to the World City Festival from Hong Kong. We are live from the stunning uh, Peninsula Hotel. We're here in the, the presidential suite. A huge thank you to the Peninsula Hotel for having us. I'm Anna Corrin, international correspondent and anchor for CNN, and it is my pleasure to be your moderator today. Uh, let me introduce our esteemed panelists. First, Next to me is Andrew Weir, Regional Senior Partner for KPMG Hong Kong and KPMG Global Chair Asset Management. Welcome. Thank you. Laura Cha, Chairman, Woman <laughs> of the Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing and voted by Fortune Magazine as one of the most uh, powerful women in the world. Congratulations. And finally, Dr. Ao King Lun, Executive Director of the Financial Services Development Council. Great to have you. All with us. Thank you so much. And obviously, we are here to discuss Hong Kong's role as Asia's financial powerhouse and whether that has been affected by the events over the last 12 plus months. Now, the format for the discussion today is that our panel discussion will, will go for the next half hour and then we will take QA from our, our audience. So please send in your questions on the system. We will have 20 minutes allocated to the Q and A. I want to open up discussion to our, our panel to start with. Hong Kong's chief executive, Carrie Lam, came out this week uh, saying that the city has to redeem its tarnished reputation among the international community. Uh, how do you believe that the world views Hong Kong right now? I think that we were very much affected by the images that the Western media and the global media has, has shown from the social unrest of last year all the way through the pandemic. Uh, like everybody else, we have been affected, but we have an extra uh, layer of uh, challenges that we have to overcome. We definitely need to refresh our brand. Uh, we need to tell the Hong Kong story we need to tell the world that the core values of Hong Kong remain intact. That is the rule of law, our resilience, our importance as an international financial centre. What makes us great under one country, two system still remain. Andrew, do you think that the damage that was done over the last 12 plus months is irreparable? Uh, nice to see you, Anna. Um, I don't think it's irreparable at all, but uh, I agree with Laura. We, we need to have a very positive messaging and branding of the reality on the ground. I mean, I, I'm a businessman, I've been here many years, I have a very independent view on this. Yes, uncertainty is not good for business. Um, brand is impacted by images in the media, but some of the analysis uh, about Hong Kong is actually not correct. And, and I think the role of people like our, ourselves is to get the true message out there. It's not positioning or propaganda or anything like that. It's just saying the reality on the ground is not quite as characterized. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. The scale of IPOs in Hong Kong actually is at an all-time high. Um, I've just stepped down as chairman of the listing committee, but pipeline was huge. Repatriation of listings, the scale of offshore RMB is very, very high, Anna. And also um, bank deposits in Hong Kong. There hasn't been capital flight. In fact, it's the other way. Uh, capital has come in. But these messages maybe don't get out there quite clearly enough. So I, I think we just need to be a lot better in explaining the reality on the ground for business, which is different to what one sees in the newspapers. Uh, Dr. Al, if you had to advise the chief executive on how to repair Hong Kong's image, what sort of issues need to be addressed? Well, I think um, I just want to echo uh, Kara and Andrew. Uh, Hong Kong ha has a lot of uh, positive attributes going for us. Now, we are still the very super connector between China and the rest of the world. In fact, now I've been um, in this new role for almost three months. I've been talking to a lot of uh, industry uh, practitioners, you know, key stakeholders. Yes, um, they are a bit concerned, but at the same time, they're telling me that they really enjoy living in Hong Kong. You know, um, you know we offer a very good lifestyle, you know, four seasons, <laughs> and uh, most importantly, opportunity, right? Um, risk and opportunity, as uh, you know, we have this famous Chinese proverb, always come together. So the um, geopolitics actually makes Hong Kong even more important strategically. Um, uh, you know, as uh, Andrew said, you know, we have seen uh, a lot of actually new capital coming into Hong Kong. We have you know, uh, you know, many exciting IPOs, right? Uh, 
either have been listed or you know, um, in the pipeline. So uh, these are the positive attributes I think you know, we need to emphasize. And also you know, engaging more um, industry practitioners to share the experience, you know, what it is really like on the ground. Well, let me ask you this. Has the, the national security law, has that unnerved the business community? I would say that in the beginning, people were a little uncomfortable. Um, I think what it does offer is a sense of certainty and stability, which if we recall prior to this passage of the publication of this law, there were, particularly last year with the social unrest, there was a lot of uncertainty about the law and order in Hong Kong, about the, whether we, we could go on on our ordinary life without disruption, without fear. I think these were very real on the ground. National security law gave, provided clarity, certainty, mm -hmm. stability, certainly. And I think um, people are settling down on that. We will, you know, of course, see how the world will, mm. how we will react to it. But this is still in the early days. And so far, I would say that the business community welcomed that. Well, Carrie Lam has said that the national security law has seen a, a restoration of, of, of social uh, stability, but there is no denying that that public discontent mm. is still there, bubbling beneath the surface. People can't come out and protest because of the national security law, mm. but that sentiment is still there. And, and politics aside, it's things like affordable housing, yeah. the scarcity of job opportunities for, yeah. for native yeah. Hong Kongers. Yeah. How are those issues going to be addressed? Well, uh, Anna, let me first clarify. The national security law in Article 4 specifically protects the right of Hong Kong citizens mm. to come out for demonstration, yeah. and that is specifically written there for the protection. What it does not allow is when people come out and advocate independence. I think that is a separate issue. Hong Kong has always been very accustomed to having protests. Every weekend, we have protests of some sort. As long as they're peaceful, as long as they're not advocating independence, mm -hmm. I think that's fine. And definitely, there are social issues that the government should address, and some of those uh, have been there for a long time, and perhaps the government should have addressed it earlier. And we now, in this administration, the government are taking active steps and try to address these. And of course, with the pandemic, some of the issues become even more pronounced mm -hmm. and the urgency is really there. So these have not um, been lost on the administration. Mm -hmm. Yes, national security law provides some sort of stability, but the, as you said, the underlying issues remain to be resolved. Mm. Andrew, uh, Hong Kong has been an international financial mm -hmm. center for, for many years. Is that under threat after what has transpired here? Um, I think yes and no. Um, it's under threat unless everybody realises there's a challenge to, and real concrete action is always required to maintain an IFC, let alone get it to the next level. Laura set up the Financial Services Development mm -hmm. Council a few years ago with exactly this brief. And it, it's, it's a mindset thing. The days of just laissez-faire, let everything work its way out, doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. There needs to be positive policy developments and initiatives to maintain status as an IFC and then develop it. And the thing I always say is the first step of being an IFC, remaining competitive, is to take away obvious examples of lack of competitiveness. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of tax policies and new initiatives and new frameworks, new capital markets initiatives mm -hmm. to address that. Um, so I, I think it's a wake-up call that, you know, IFCs are changing all the time. And the laissez-faire, low-tax model of Hong Kong in the past, which felt everybody would just automatically come, other, com uh, other countries have this now. And one's just got to bring new things to the table. And I think the best example of this would be the new listing regime on biotech, um, weighted voting rights, uh, innovative companies, which is the only one in the world which is dedicated to that. And there's been very significant tax changes on private equity, for example, carry interest and things like this, the new LLP. We just need more and more of this. And then the positioning of these changes as, as they come through. So, so the risk owner is actually sitting on the laurels, um, not responding to media challenge or external challenge, and not realizing the world has changed very, very 
much and one has to fight for the status and fight for the capital, which has a choice of where to go. Well, Dr. Al, Singapore is, is certainly proving to, to be a main competitor mm. to Hong Kong. How much of a threat does Singapore pose? Yeah, actually, I would put the question back to the audience because when you run a business, um, you don't want to put all eggs in one basket, right? You always want to diversify. You want more products, you want more cities, you want more countries, right? So I think we, Hong Kong and Singapore decision is not binary. You know, um, we have already mentioned you know, what um, we can offer in Hong Kong. Right? Uh, Singapore also uh, has you know, their own advantages. So I would say when people look at Hong Kong, they should look at what we stand for, you know, what we can offer, you know, opportunities, liquidity, access to China. I think um, these cannot be replaced very easily. Mm. I, yeah. I think Singapore is a, is a good market, actually. Um, but I think there's a tendency to overstate um, its IPO market in comparison to Hong Kong, capital market. I don't think there's a legit com legitimate comparison. But on the fund side, one has to say, Singapore is on a lot of good things uh, to attract companies in the asset management side. And I think one of the big things we're trying to do in Hong Kong is encourage policies really, really to support and attract and retain asset management companies. Laura, on the issue of IPOs, mm -hmm. Ant Financial is about to list in Hong Kong and Shanghai. It will be the biggest IPO ever. Its parent company, Alibaba, listed on the New York Stock Exchange back right. in 2014. Yes. The fact that it's being done out of Hong Kong and Shanghai obviously represents a dramatic shift. Mm -hmm. Tell us the, the significance of this. I think it is um, uh, the Ant IPO really uh, demonstrated and it's going to demonstrate that Hong Kong, and both Hong Kong and Shanghai for that matter, can attract sufficient capital. There are capital in the market looking for good investment. For the longest time, I think if we go back 10, 15 years, there was always the perception that Hong Kong was a regional market. You cannot attract, we, you know, it was believed that we could not attract global capital. But in the last decade, we've demonstrated that we are capable to do that. Mm. And the reason we were capable to do that is because the, we give investor confidence. Investor and global money has no boundary, no border. They will go to the market where it makes the most sense, where it has the most liquidity, where it has a set of standard that is reliable and respected mm. by the international investors. And Hong Kong has been trying to keep up on our part to make ourselves attractive so that we can continue to inspire investor confidence. So the trend that we are seeing is that we are going to be a pretty credible alternative to markets in the US. And I think N is a very good demonstration of that. Yeah. Uh, Shanghai obviously can't do it by mm. themselves, mm. but how long do you believe before Shanghai, Shenzhen can, can list this sort of IPO um, alone? I think it will um, take time. The, 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 the only, right now, the very key factor is that the currency is not convertible. So we're talking about the domestic Chinese market. As long as there's capital control and the, and the currency and renminbi is not freely convertible, it is very difficult for international capital to go in, right? And then there is, uh, uh, I think, restriction in China because they really want to keep their market under control to a certain extent. If they completely open up, which I believe one day they will, but it's not yet at that stage, then I think it is very important that we see that, you know, these are in our region, Singapore, Samjian, Shanghai, they're all our competitors. You know, the, the, you know uh, data is our competitor. A lot of, a lot of uh, competition comes from different aspects and we just need to equip and prepare ourselves. Well, Hong Kong has always been this link between mm. East and West, but has that role changed? Uh, with the pandemic, with economic recessions, uh, with uh, the geopolitical tensions um, now at play? Uh, no, actually, I think we have, Hong Kong has become even more relevant because in the world where there is so much uncertainty in the global geopolitical environment, 
there's so much tension between the East and the West, if we could just use broadly that term. Then there's even more need for connections, mm -hmm. not fewer connections, but more connection. We need to connect the dot. And Hong Kong has always played that role well, and we will become even more relevant. And in being more relevant, we have to equip and keep up our standards and make sure that the confidence in our market will continue. I think we have a continuing relevant role to play. Andrew, you and I were discussing the Greater Bay Area mm. is a shot in the arm for Hong Kong. How will it assist uh, in, in Hong Kong's development moving forward? Uh, I think Greater Bay Area is much more than a slogan. Uh, it, it really is, is something real. And uh, the best way to characterise it is Hong Kong's hinterland has now become a market of 70 million people. And the GDP of Hong Kong and Greater Bay Area is at the same level of the UK. So it's sort of sixth, seventh largest economy in the world. And with that comes huge opportunities. Uh, what are those opportunities? Well, the framework is very much to push technology, uh, high-end manufacturing, and financial services. And all that plays beautifully into Hong Kong's sweet spot. So you hear a lot, there's a very interesting uh, pronouncements last week uh, about the role of Shenzhen. Yeah. I actually see that as hugely positive for Hong Kong. Mm. And Hong Kong and Shenzhen working as tandem is maybe the first real meaningful step on, on GBA, I, I think has a lot of potential. A lot of our major global real estate funds and private equity funds are investing in Greater Bay Area, but, but and it's interesting, they invest for two reasons. One is to get the cross-border effect and find emerging privately owned enterprises who want to internationalize stopping off at Hong Kong first. But the second one, and people forget that, is the pure wealth effect of the wealthiest part of China, which is southern China. The development of those cities and domestic markets on the back of GBA. They see that as a real growth engine. And just finally, you know, I, I travel a lot and I go to Middle East a lot, for example. They now see the Greater Bay Area rather like sort of Belt and Road, but they see Greater Bay Area as a big policy-driven initiative where they see a lot of growth potential for themselves if they drop capital into it. So I think GBA is, is great for the future of Hong Kong. I think actually it's fundamental to the future. Two challenges. The first one is how to ensure, going to your point earlier, on inequality and social challenge that it is embraced enough in Hong Kong as being a solution to this. And secondly, touching on the point Laura made about data. The long-term future of data, cross-border data, what GBA data, where it should be, what that means, is something which I, I, I know is being looked at. But if that can be got right, it can be an absolute game changer. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Ao, traditionally Hong Kong has been a hub for, for family offices mm -hmm. and private wealth mm -hmm. Uh, management. Do you believe that Hong Kong still has an edge with this, considering the, the geopolitical uncertainty and the, the social unrest here in Hong Kong? Yeah. I'd uh, like to say that Hong Kong have been through a lot of challenges uh, over the years, and we have always uh, come out uh, better on the other side. Uh, I'm sure this time is uh, no different, mm -hmm. because um, looking back uh, in the late 80s, you know, when the, everyone uh, was concerned about the handover uncertainty, so we had a brain drain. But look at Hong Kong, you know, it now, you know, uh, you know, one of the biggest uh, IFC in the world uh, in terms of you know, more transaction volume uh, and um, number of IPOs, uh, fundraising capacity. Uh, just to, to name a few things, when ultra high net worth um, looking at a place where uh, to set up their family offices or uh, major investment portfolios, I would like to think that um, they consider it like uh, making a strategic real estate investment. The three considerations, location, location, and location. Location to opportunities and liquidity. We have covered that uh, very extensively. Location to philanthropy and impact investing. This is really a global trend now, talking about sustainability. Mm. In Hong Kong, um, I don't know whether uh, you know um, about this you know, figure, that more than 15,000 charity organizations in Hong Kong Mm. Right. Uh, and the government and regulators have been introducing a lot of ESG initiative. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, there's no leader in this um, region yet, but I think you know, uh, yeah. you know, we have you know, every opportunity to set the regional standard. Um, and then the third location is lifestyle. Right? 
Hong Kong is the largest uh, art auction market um, mm. outside of uh, New York. Um, and we consume the most luxurious wine, uh, red Bordeaux uh, in mm. the world, right? 16% um, of the market. Right, just to name a few. So yeah. the, this is, the, yeah. yeah. So I that's why, the, and, and, and one, one, one last point. Drink a little wine. No, again, <laughs> Hong Kong um, is the largest private wealth management center next, um, just behind Switzerland. Mm. That's a very little, uh, you know, yeah. not a very long uh, fact, but. And I think if I could add on the sustainability, I think the pandemic has been through a wake up call for the business community where sustainable finance, sustainability of itself, sustainable finance is really very important for the financial world. We are going to see more and more investors demanding on sustainable financing products, green finance and the whole, air, a whole array yeah. of different products. And Hong Kong wants to be the sustainability financial center in this part of the world and beyond. And uh, it is very much uh, something that we champion at HKEX, and we have uh, upgraded our disclosure into a, a listing rule, as Andrew will well know. All these are putting us in the forefront, and it goes to how do we continue to attract investors to our market. Mm -hmm. And another, another point on the GBA is that the best analogy is Wall Street plus Silicon Valley. We have mm -hmm. Sunjan, as the innovative hub in China. Many innovation had come out from that, from that little city, which only 40 years ago was you know, in the backwaters. And then of course with Hong Kong as an international financial center, is really Wall Street plus Silicon Valley. That's a good word. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the, the brain drain a little bit earlier, mm. Dr. Allen. Obviously, there was concern after the handover. There is concern too that there is a brain drain going yeah. on. Yeah. Obviously, with the national security law, some people are leaving mm -hmm. Hong Kong, and then, of course, the, the pandemic. But let me ask you this question. With the protests, more than 10,000 people were arrested, majority of them young people, students. More than 2,000 of those have been charged. Many of them will do time behind jail. I'm, I'll share my experience uh, first, because I've recently taken up, uh, taken up a, a junk professorship uh, at Hong Kong U. Yes, you So you I've been engaging uh, yes. with uh, you know, uh, my students over the past few months. I think it's all down to communication. Um, there, there's this myth that uh, you know, they don't have a future in Hong Kong because uh, not all of them have a uh, strong connection with uh, uh, mainland China, and they don't mm -hmm. probably speak you know, uh, as fluent in Mandarin as the, the local mainlanders do. But actually, Hong Kong is an international financial center. There are a lot of opportunities. I can mention quite a few. Risk management, compliance, mm -hmm. IT, FinTech. You, know, you don't need to speak Mandarin to be good you know, in all this. Mm -hmm. right? um, so it's about communication, giving them you know, uh, a hope that there's actually a very bright future for them and for Hong Kong because they are the future of Hong Kong. Of course, yeah. of course. Well, you mentioned uh, fintech, and Andrew, we were was discussing this. Obviously, it's, it's transformed um, the financial industry. Do you believe uh, that digital currency is a key driver to, yeah. to Hong Kong's future? Yeah, I, I think fintech, just first, is a massive driver. Mm -hmm. and I, I love that description of Silicon Valley and mm -hmm. Wall Street, this coming together of Hong Kong and Shenzhen, international capital market, and a world-leading so sort of artificial intelligence and innovation hub. You know, it, it really is fantastic. The big change we've seen on, on fintech generally um, is the scale of what's being done in China and what's being done by the big financial institutions in Hong Kong. Fintech has moved from maybe smaller startups into massive investment in technology by the larger institutions, be even payment platforms from China or, or, or financial institutions, and the sheer scale of what's being developed on fintech in Hong Kong and southern China is, is really well beating. Uh, it, it's fantastic. Now, digital currency is a very interesting one. Um, digital RMB, mm -hmm. offshore RMB, mm -hmm. offshore digital M RMB, there's only one direction of travel. Mm -hmm. The attractiveness of it in many different ways is, is, is overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And I think you'll see probably the RMB being seen as a leading 
one of the leading currencies in, in the digitalization. It is the way we're going. I mean, just dragging it down to a slightly more prosaic level, Anna, when my colleagues come from uh, our office in China, we have 10,000 people in China, they turn up, their biggest problem is they're not carrying any cash. Right. You know, <laughs> so it's a cashless society. And, and I, I think in the West, people don't realize just how hugely advanced it is in China and also in Hong Kong. Yeah. Uh, so I think the digitalization of currency, in many, um, I know there's a number of companies looking to list in Hong Kong. We've, we've had um, a number of companies exploring whether to do coin IPOs, inter yeah. initial coin offerings, ICO, all of that ICO. Yeah. So I think a resounding yes uh, to your question, yeah. Anna. The strength of institutions like the Hong Kong MA, the SFC, has been very important. It's a very important component mm -hmm. uh, to Hong Kong's role as a, as a financial centre. Uh, what do you believe needs to, to be done to maintain this integrity? I think um, the, we have a very good infrastructure. The regulatory infrastructure has always been very strong and we have always kept up with international standards when we attend, whether it's HKMA or the SFC, or for that matter, HKEX, when we go to international forum, we are at the head table. Mm -hmm. We have a voice, we participate. It's not just you know, a, a given. Uh, we really actively engage with the international community to know what are some of the latest development and how Hong Kong cannot be left behind and having a professionally run institutions like HKMA and the SFC are very important to maintain the integrity of our system. Well, let me ask you this, whilst we've only got a few more seconds before we, we go over to Q&A. Uh, what is your vision for Hong Kong? What do you think is the future for, for this marvellous city? Right, I think we will continue to strive and as King Ao said, um, we have had many challenges in the past. We have always been resilient. I think if one thing that we would characterize Hong Kong people is the resilience. Yeah. It's the strength, the fact that we have to face challenges and there are challenges and we face them head on. In each challenge, there will be people who want to leave and that is fine because we are an open society. There's nothing to stop money from coming in or out. We have not stopped people from leaving or if they could come in on a legitimate basis. So we will continue to strive as an open, free society. International finance is an important part, will be one of the, continue to be one of the pillar. And I think we will be conti continue to be an exciting place to live and work. What do you believe is, is the future for Hong Kong, Dr. Al, considering that, that you do speak to a lot of young students, a lot of people who, who are looking to this city to, to build a life, uh, build, a, build, a, build a future? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go back to uh, the GBA uh, topic. Uh, I think um, this is a wonderful opportunity for Hong Kong, for everyone, because uh, Hong Kong itself is a very small market, you know, 7 million people, but you know, the GBA is 10 times bigger. Right? Um, so the future of Hong Kong I think, is to amplify our super connector role. Um, and going back to uh, Roar said, you know, we're very resilient, we're uh, you know, survivors. You know, this is the Hong Kong spirit. This is what we need to uh, promote. Mm. Where does that resilience come from? I mean, I've lived in Hong Kong for, mm. for 12 years mm. and, and I've seen that resilience, but, but as, as people who, who were born here, grew up here, where does that resilience come from? For our generation, you know, our parents' generation came from the war. A lot of them came from the mainland and um, refugees of sort. And refugees always work hard. Immigrants, in those days, were refugees. In these today, we call them the immigrants, right? The immigrants always work very hard because they know what they, have, they left behind the hardship and forge a better future for themselves. I think the resilience is really ingrained in all of yeah. us from education. We saw our parents and then we saw how China developed and we saw how Hong Kong as a small backwater, a very regional market 20, uh, 30 years ago developed to today. It's a lot of hard work and really we have to see beyond, we have to deal with the problem 
in front of us, but we also have to see beyond what are the possibilities and strive for that. Mm. I mean, Andrew, you've lived in this city for, for a very long time. Mm. What impresses you most about Hong Kong? I think I've just come back from the UK, actually, um, on a trip. The collective approach to, let's say, the virus, um, the collective approach to um, downturns, a collective approach to societal problems. There's something special here. And um, the working together uh, is, is unique. Um, another thing I'd just say is that there's a natural DNA in, in Hong Kong of people wanting to succeed, work hard, progress. Mm. And you, you touch on some of the challenges, but it comes back to that. People need to see that mm -hmm. there's a platform, an environment which allow, allows them to thrive. So just finally, as a businessman, Hong Kong is by far the best place in the world. If you want networks, want to build relationships, the correlation between the effort you put in, the people you know, and the opportunity that flows is probably the best in the world. Fantastic. Well, I think uh, it, it's very obvious that, that everybody here believes very strongly in, uh, in the future of Hong Kong, which is wonderful to see. Let's now turn it over to our audience who have submitted questions. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, I think this is a general question uh, for the panel. While greater integration with China and recognition of the Greater Bay Area as an economy sounds attractive for capital, how do local residents um, feel about that? Who would like to start? Yeah, uh, you're talking about GBA, the integration? Yes. Yeah. Um, Actually, uh, Hong Kong uh, has a very important role to play. Uh, it ultimately, is renminbi internationalization. If you look at Hong Kong uh, uh, over the years, it has been used as a sandbox for China to uh, try out um, capital account liberalization policies, you know, starting with X shares listing, um, and, and then we have renminbi clearing center, uh, M, uh, mutual recognition of funds, stock connect, bond connect. Now, um, you know, even DCEP. Right. Um, uh, right now, it's an initial uh, domestic trial, but ultimately, you know, they want to roll it out you know, for international users. Hong Kong is ideally suited for that. The question goes on to say, don't they have to embrace that before international capital and companies well, will come? It, yeah, it's, it's a very good question, because I, I hinted at that when I spoke about GBA. Mm -hmm. There still is a challenge to get the broader community to see the benefit. And, Why is that? Why uh, is that? Because I, I, don't, I, I think what it is, Anna, is people have to see the unit the, behind the scenes, there's huge amounts being done on healthcare, education, real estate, all of these things. People need to see projects coming, coming to life where um, the combining of the know how in Hong Kong with, quite frankly, the, 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 the greater land uh, in southern China. People need to start to see the benefits coming through from a community perspective. So I think the question is very clever because actually from a business viewpoint and a capital viewpoint, it's a no-brainer. But getting hearts and minds to mm. see the true opportunity needs mm. some of the social infrastructure concepts and some of the livelihood matters mm. to come through quite quickly. So it may take a bit of time for that to come through. Is there reluctance yeah. from Hong Kongers to embrace well, the, the GBA? I think, okay. you know, when one uses the term integration, there's fear among certain people in Hong Kong and that we're going to be integrated mm. into China. But in fact, it's not necessarily the case. I use the example of listing state-owned enterprise in Hong Kong some 25 years ago, and I was part of that effort. At that time, there was a lot of fear. You allow Chinese state-owned camp, you know, these socialist companies to come to Hong Kong to list, in droves, you are going to contaminate our market. Mm -hmm. This was the thinking 25 years mm -hmm. ago. 25 years, now 28 years later, Chinese companies occupy 67% of our market capitalization. By and large, these companies abide by Hong Kong rules. Mm -hmm. We have one set of law, one set of rules. Everybody who come will have to comply with our law. No. So what have been, we have been doing is we impose Hong Kong values into the companies that come and want to assess international capital. So I look at GBA as it's as much we Hong Kong using the hinterland, but many areas we are using Hong Kong standard, Hong Kong value. Mm -hmm. And the more we embrace this, 
the more we project that, and that is what the, the, on the Chinese side, they want the, on the mainland side, they want Hong Kong standard. People come to Hong Kong to list, they look at it as a badge of honor. Of course. Right? They know it's that legitimate. we're- legitimate. Yeah, it's, it's a legitimate, the quality is there, the standard is there. So if you extend that analogy to the wider community, that is what Greater Bay Area will be. We utilize all that land space, all the, the capital, re the, the resources, with 70 million population, but we have to insist on the Hong Kong standard and value. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think that is a really will be successful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Laura has got this spot on. We are actually leading um, uh, the changes, you know, because we are um, setting the standard, you know, uh, the best practice standard uh, for a lot of the mainland firms. And now, you know, uh, for the GBA region, take, uh, going back to sustainability, um, you know, uh, you, you look at the construction industry, because uh, according to the uh, uh, World Bank, 70% you know, of the carbon actually uh, you know, came from construction. So um, there are only three standards in the world. One is uh, for uh, certifying green construction project, US, UK, and China. But the China standard is really uh, all in Chinese and for the domestic market. And this is where Hong Kong you know, can take the lead, you know, China uh, breached the gap. Uh, and again, if you look at the, uh, it this way, Hong Kong is actually you know, um, taking a, a leading position in you know, all these, uh, you know, changes and, yeah, new policies. So people shouldn't be scared? No. People shouldn't be alarmed? No, a big no should not, yeah. No. Uh, Laura, there is a question for you. How likely will Hong Kong Exchange further change its listing rules to permit corporate shareholders to own more voting mm. rights <laughs> to attract more large-cap <laughs> Chinese companies to list in Hong Kong? We had um, held a consultation and uh, the conclusions are being collected. I think we will have this out uh, fairly soon. I think Andrew is... Uh, Can we get the scoop? <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid I cannot uh, say that at this stage. But it is an issue of great concern to us, and we are... Uh, we had the consultation as Andrew... It was under you, it right? Was, it was under Andrew, you. What can you divulge? Yeah. What I can divulge is I stepped down before it was concluded. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the... Dodging, dodging <laughs> question. Oh, Andrew, there's a question for you. Yeah. How are the geopolitical tensions between the US and China affecting family offices to manage their offshore assets? Oh, great question. If I can maybe just make it a bit broader ab Please. about the geopolitical thing. Uh, as we discussed yesterday, um, I've had a series of conversations with regional and global heads of finance houses, family offices, security houses about Hong Kong situation on the ground mm. and the reality. All of those concluded with no drastic decisions about reducing headcount, withdrawing, setting up alternative offices, which is, is very, very interesting. And in a strange way, you know, I won't get into the pros and cons of the security law, but from the ramifications of it, one or two ramifications I've seen is uncertainty has certainly reduced. Mm -hmm. um, but as, as time has passed. As time has passed. Yeah. I think there still there remains, no, there still remains the some as well. But the, the main point is it triggered the question and the discussion. So, and it focused the discussion. So uh, I've done quite a lot of sessions with boards, regional global boards saying that this is the reality on the ground in Hong Kong. And to cut a long story short, the impact of the US-China aspect by and large um, is significantly less than one would expect, having uh, what one sees in the newspaper. The broader capital market, the US dollar clearing side, all of that, which Hong Kong has a massive role, is largely untouched. And behind the scenes, a lot of the major US and other businesses are actually always lobbying to keep business moving. So there's a, there's a clear political message on, on the sanctions, and there's a clear media message, which I totally understand and I respect. But in terms of business, actually, the knock-on effect has been fairly limited um, at this stage, unless there's some sort of drastic change. Um, I think that'd be the situation. That's been the conclusion which all the organisations I've been speaking to. But Anna, the point is there have been these discussions. And I'd say the worst case has been a defer on a decision of whether to do more or just wait and see. Mm -hmm. There hasn't been exits or relocations or restrictions on ability to do business. Are you concerned, however, that, that Hong Kong will suffer uh, 
in the, this game, you know, this power play game it, between the United States. At the and end Europe. of the day, Hong Kong has been um, the pawn in the game. Of course, it? No, it really has. But um, that sort of Damocles about being a preferred trading territory that's now gone because uh, the sort of Damocles has been used. Um, I'm still very confident, uh, going to what King Al says, that the resilience of Hong Kong and the sheer just uh, geopolitical and strategic attractiveness of it mm -hmm. and its role between East and West, mainland and West, mm -hmm. in a strange way, is even greater. Mm -hmm. Is even greater. And we've just got to realise this, harness it and get the message out. If I can just say to our audience, if you have questions that you would like to submit to our panel, please do through do so through the system. Uh, Dr. Al, if I can ask you, uh, in the face of the, the new players in the financial market, such as, as virtual banks, how should traditional banks reinvent themselves to stay ahead or keep up with the, the competition? Yeah, um, I think the uh, virtual banks uh, is it, a, a great uh, wake-up call. Right, to uh, a lot of conventional banks. Uh, you look at uh, account opening, uh, you, know, you do it uh, uh, with virtual bank take minutes, uh, but it takes much longer you know, uh, physically you know, uh, with a conventional bank. Uh, but um, I think they, they have also stepped up uh, uh, their uh, game. Like, you know, a lot of them have a very versatile online platform nowadays. Uh, you know, they, so it, it is a, a, I think it is a, a friendly competition. Uh, it, it is good for uh, Hong Kong, um, and again, I have to go back to GBA because um, ultimately, uh, it would be good for Virtual Bank uh, to be able to extend their uh, services into GBA because it's a much bigger market, and um, that will also help conventional bank um, to become more um, innovative. Uh, so it, it is a friendly competition, which is good for yeah, the market. Uh, we've talked about the uniqueness of Hong Kong and, and, and why it, it will remain a, a financial centre, international financial centre, but, but what about the challenges? What, what are the challenges uh, facing Hong Kong at present? I think um, the biggest challenge we've always faced is complacency. Mm. One is that we are already there. There's a sense of pride in you know, people looking at Hong Kong financial centre. We're at the top in many areas and that's fine. And we are, then we get very really stuck into some of the local, very domestic local issues and lose sight of the bigger picture out there. Mm -hmm. I think complacency is a big threat. I think also the fact that um, other people are stepping up their games, much more so than before. Technology is a challenge. So these are all challenges that we have to face. These are all, I wouldn't say threats, but you know, really challenges that we have to take on very seriously. Andrew, what do you see as being the challenges? I think, uh, again, it's a, it's a great question. I totally agree with Laura. I, I think the biggest challenge is misinterpreting what is happening. Um, the business community, Hong Kong's economic fabric is changing. It has a very significant international component, a very significant domestic component, and a very significant mainland Chinese component. Mm. That doesn't mean there's a takeover. It doesn't mean that mm. those different components are no longer relevant. And it's a combination of mindset and having the uh, mindset, not being complacent, having the agility to realize that it is an absolute melting pot, yeah. these three different components in the business community, and they're merging across. So the big challenge I have in my own organization, is I'm an expatriate, is saying that mainland Chinese business community, financial institution, asset management, are just as much as part of our playing field mm -hmm. as the international yeah. banks. They're here because they want to have best practice, they want to internationalize. Don't restrict yourself as a person or self-censor yourself mm -hmm. into defining you're not relevant in a particular part of a market. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something we need to get right in Hong Kong. Yeah. It's changing so quickly, but there's still a very, very significant role for international people. Mm -hmm. And go back to what you said, it's an international financial community. That's why they're here. 
Well, it's interesting you say that because the people that I speak to would say that, that Hong Kong is becoming in increasingly mainland Chinese, mm. that, that there is no more place. No, it for, is. For, for gualos, No, if you but like, it is. For, it for, is. for international uh, bankers, that they will be replaced by mainland no, Chinese. No, I, I think it is. A lot of these platforms actually recruit international people and Hong yeah. Kong Chinese, and yeah. it's all about upscaling. If you're good enough and you have the content and you have best practice, mm -hmm. there's a market. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Dr. Al? Self-belief. I think we have to believe in ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's the, the biggest challenge. Uh, you know, uh, you know, we have so much going on, uh, going for us. Um, so I think we just need to believe in our core competency. And, mm -hmm. um, and as Laura said, you know, can't be complacent. Do you think that belief has been, been shaken somewhat because of what has transpired over the last 12 months? Yes. Um, yeah. And that's yeah. why no I mentioned question. earlier, uh, communication is very important. You know, we need to you know, get the key messages out to uh, everyone in Hong mm -hmm. Kong and you know, uh, all the audience here uh, uh, globally. Mm -hmm. But you know, uh, we're here for business. You know, we you know, uh, uh, are ch a truly international financial center. Mm. Uh, uh, Laura, what do you believe are China's plans for Hong Kong? Mm. How, do, how do you see, uh, you know, Hong Kong fitting in to, to mm. China's overall plans? I think Hong Kong has always has an important place in the central government's view. That's why one country, two system was designed. And Hong Kong will continue to have that important role. Um, it has not been easy for Hong Kong to get to where we are today as a well-regarded, well-respected international financial center. It is in the central government's interest, I believe, to keep Hong Kong striving because it is our window to the, their window to the world. Mm. We have been able to contribute not only as a, comp as a connector, but in many ways we have helped the reform state-owned enterprise reform through the listing in Hong Kong and many other areas too. Um, we also have been training ground for some of the professionals, some of the financial professionals who were educated in the Western world, had come to Hong Kong, have learned their trade, and then they've gone back to China. And that is a very useful uh, tool and a useful venue. And um, we, you know, I think there's every intention for the one country, two system to continue. And I, I recognize that there were fear on the part of certain people, and particularly on what happened last year. I think it did shake some people's confidence. Many of us locally mm. were shaken as well. Mm. And it is up to us to collect ourselves and really see what is there that we have to put our effort in and rebuild. I think I look at, um, like Andrew put it very nicely, the international expatriate community is here. They are stakeholders. Of course, the local Hong Kong Chinese are stakeholders. Mainland Chinese are also stakeholders. They are participants in our market. They are investors in our market. So they are our resources, just as the expatriate professional and the local talents. So it is for us and for the government to really galvanize us, to bolster Hong Kong and rebuild our confidence and to, to go on forward on the journey together. Andrew, with the, the rise of Shanghai, the rise of, of Shenzhen, where do you think Hong Kong fits into to China's master plan? I think it complements it. And I, I think still Hong Kong for many years will be the leading international finance center, the key word being international. As long as Hong Kong always has in its DNA this international uh, attractiveness and international best practice and attraction uh, to, to mainland cities, I, I think it, w it will always retain that role. I actually envisage, a, in longer term, a very complementary model of Shanghai, Shenzhen and, and Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I think um, it's, it's too facile, which has been said for many years, Shanghai will overtake Hong Kong, mm -hmm. Shenzhen will overtake. It's much more complex than that. And I, I think, as Laura mentioned, that you know, the key is at the moment there's not a freely convertible currency. Um, there is a, a, a relatively closed capital account. The particular attraction of Hong Kong as an entrepot between the West uh, and the rest of Asia into mainland is still very, very strong.
So what does the government need to do to, to sell Hong Kong to the world? I mean, we, we can say it over and over again. I think but it's got to be innovative. The work has to be done. Uh, and uh, Laura mentioned it. Uh, Hong Kong actually has the world's largest sovereign green bond market, but mm -hmm. not many people know it. And there's a lot of initiatives being done. It's just got to keep at it because if Hong Kong stands still and policy stands still, mm -hmm. it, it will get overtaken. Yeah. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, I think that, that wraps it up unless there's any closing comments that, that you would like to make. Laura? Oh, I think I'm very positive about the future of Hong Kong, but there's a lot of hard work ahead of us. Of course. No question. Of course. Dr. Al? Just believe in ourselves. Believe in ourselves. I think that's a, that's a wonderful note to finish on. Well, Andrew Weir from KPMG, Laura Cha, Chairwoman of the Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing, and Dr. Al King Lun uh, from the Financial Services Development Council, our esteemed panel, thank you thank so you. much thank for sharing you your, your insights, your knowledge, and, and your, your vision for, for this city that we obviously all love. We want it to succeed. We want it to, to strive. That's... that's that is uh, definite. And uh, thank, thank you, you to our audience uh, very much for, for joining us and to watching for watching our, our panel. We hope that you have uh, enjoyed it. Uh, please stay tuned uh, for the next uh, discussion, which will be on uh, best practices um, on the pandemic here in Hong Kong. I'm Anna Corrin. Thank you so much for, for watching.